Good afternoon, everyone. My pleasure to welcome you to the Wednesday afternoon lecture for today. Our speaker is Frederick Alt, whose topic, Antibodies, Genome Stability in Cancer, covers a lot of territory. And I think you'll be in for a treat uh, listening to the way in which this uh, distinguished investigator has been approaching uh, this problem and bringing together through the central theme of double-stranded breaks and what happens to them uh, after they break, uh, insights from immunology, or you could say without double-stranded breaks there would be no immune response, and cancer, where of course double-stranded breaks uh, take a darker turn. Uh, Fred Alts is a distinguished investigator in both of these fields. As a uh, PhD student at Stanford, uh, Fred discovered the phenomenon of gene amplification, uh, which we now take for granted as a fundamental feature of the way in which cancer cells uh, develop some of their abilities to grow out of control. But at that point, it was considered quite surprising uh, that the germline genome would have that kind of capability of such dramatic uh, rearranging and amplifying. Uh, here we are now uh, in the 60th uh, year since Watson and Crick described the double helix that will be coming up in just about four weeks on April 25th when that paper in Nature appeared in 1953. And we've certainly learned a lot about that double helix, although we have lots more to learn. And certainly Fred Alt has contributed more than his share uh, of many of the things uh, that we now take for granted uh, along the way in terms of particularly how DNA can be rearranged and uh, reconnected. Uh, in addition to his work on amplification, played critical roles in understanding VDJ recombination, allelic exclusion, other fundamental issues in immunology, and in the field of cancer, uh, was the initial person to describe the NMIC gene and a variety of other crucial phenomenon which I suspect he will be talking about today in terms of some of the more recent findings, uh, where he has now uh, melded together some high-throughput genomics uh, with a more comprehensive view of what happens with double-stranded breaks than I think most people would have imagined possible even a few years ago. Uh, Fred got his uh, PhD from Stanford, uh, went on after that to do postdoc uh, with David Baltimore, uh, and uh, subsequently to that, has spent most of his time in the wonderful city of Boston, where he is now the Charles A. Janeway Professor of Pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. He's also Professor of Genetics at Harvard, an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and President of the Immune Disease Institute uh, in Boston. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the Institute of Medicine, and has received in 2007 the NCI's Alfred Knutson Award for pioneering contributions that have revolutionized the field of cancer genetics. He's been a faithful servant to NIH's needs, uh, serving on boards of scientific counselors and other advisory uh, committees for which we are most grateful. So please, would you join me in welcoming today's speaker, uh, Dr. Fred Alt. All right, well, let's see. Thanks very much, Francis. That was a wonderful introduction, maybe one of the best I've ever had. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here again, again meaning um, I was, I think, just giving a talk in this room two months ago uh, for the immunology focus group. And, and today um, I'm going to cover a lot of the same material, uh, but it will be somewhat of a different talk and there will be some new things. And, uh, what I want to talk about are, um, I gave that broad title, but in, in, in another, I changed the title a little bit to Mechanisms of DNA Rearrangements and Chromosomal Translocations in the Immune System. Um, and I'm going to go through this, uh, oh, I should go back to, the th um, just to mention here that we're going to focus on, I mentioned antibodies in the title, and, and that will be a, a major focus, antibody genes, and, and as you know, Antibodies are made of a pair of identical heavy and light polypeptide chains, and the N-terminal variable regions of these chains are encoded by VDJ segments that are assembled during lymphocyte development, and the constant region of the heavy chain determines the class and effector function of the antibody molecule, and it's changed later in development, and those are the reactions that I'm going to focus on. So I'll spend the first um, five or ten minutes giving you a little bit of background uh, on 
immunoglobulin uh, gene diversification. So VDJ recombination assembles the variable regions of immunoglobulin, heavy and light chains, and also T cell receptor uh, uh, alpha and beta and gamma and delta chains. And the basic reaction is, is very similar. The, 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 uh, in these different loci in the genome, V, D, and J segments are rearranged and put together into a complete exon encoding the VDJ portion and the variable region of the uh, different chains. Um, now, the mechanism of VDJ recombination is something that, that many of us have worked on for a long time. And I just summarize it pretty briefly here, and, and I'm not going to focus on this, but just tell you a couple of new things that, that uh, have, have come out. Um, so what we know is that, that VDJ recombination, as shown in David Baltimore's lab years ago, is initiated by the RAG endonuclease, which has the role of recognizing short conserved recognition sequences that flank all VD and J segments. Um, and binding and then introducing a double-strand break between the recognition sequence and a V and a D or a D and a J segment that are then to be joined. That's the main role of RAG in the reaction. It's not a recombinase, it's more of an endonuclease that makes a break. And at that point, it hands the reaction over to a major DNA repair pathway in cells, the uh, uh, non-homologous end joining pathway. And basically, in that pathway, non-homologous end joining factors, and I won't go through all the details, but um, uh, the coup proteins bind, those uh, protect the ends, and then they recruit other proteins, uh, including DNA PK and Artemis, which process coding ends because they're generated as hairpins, and then a series of proteins, XRCC4, DNA ligase 4, that join these ends back together uh, to make per perfectly joined signal ends and then the coding ends that make the VDJ segment. And the one thing that I'd point out is that, that we've learned in, in uh, past years is I'm going to talk later about the ATM-dependent DNA double-strand break response, where ATM is a protein that again recognizes double-strand breaks, phosphorylates a number of proteins that make big complexes in chromatin, and that's involved in checkpoint control and other aspects of DNA double-strand break repair. But what we found recently is that a, a protein that was discovered because it is involved in immunodeficiencies in humans but isn't what we've shown is really not required for VDJ recombination, actually has a complete overlapping role with all these members of the ATM-dependent double-strand break response, and in the absence of any one of them, uh, XLF is absolutely required for VDJ recombination. And conversely, these proteins are not really required, but in the absence of XLF, each one of them is absolutely required for VDJ recombination. And that's something that, uh, how that actually works and the exact functions is something that we don't fully understand, but it's uh, given us some new insights into the role of this family of proteins in the actual uh, repair of DNA double-strand breaks at the, the level of actually uh, promoting their joining. So VDJ recombination occurs early uh, in B-cell development uh, or in developing T-cells. So it occurs uh, by, uh, in, in B-cell development, uh, early in development in pro-B cells, Ds are joined to Js, then Vs are joined to Djs to make the VDJ heavy chain variable region. The heavy chain's expressed and then cells move on to a stage where they rearrange light chain genes. Once the light chain is productively rearranged and combines with the heavy chain, it gets put on the surface of the resulting B cell as a receptor. And then those B cells go out into the periphery where they can undergo uh, additional genomic rearrangement events. And a very similar pathway occurs in the assembly of, of T cell receptor genes. So when B cells go out into the periphery as mature surface immunoglobulin positive B cells, and they come into contact with a cognate antigen that will bind to their receptor, and usually, but not always, with the help of T cells, they will be activated and they will proliferate. And then we'll turn on a, a protein discovered by Hanjo a number of years ago called activation induced cytidine deaminase that leads to mutation of variable region exons so that it can allow selection of B cells that have higher affinity for antigen than was encoded in the germline uh, segments of the receptor. And then uh, also can, in, in, in other situations, it can, in activated B cells, it can uh, affect a, a process called class switch recombination that exchanges the constant region uh, of the heavy chain so that it can make different classes of antibody molecules. And I'll, I'll talk a lot about this particular reaction today. So one thing that, uh, and I'm not going to talk so much about uh, somatic hypermutation. Uh, um, one thing uh, that is very 
useful about uh, uh, class switch recombination, if one wants to study a reaction, is that you can purify surface immunoglobulin B cells from the spleen, and in culture, you can activate them with different combinations of activating molecules that, for example, mimic B cell, T cell interactions and cytokines. And over the period of three or four days, you can um, induce a large percentage of them to undergo a class switch recombination event. So as I'll talk about today, if you treat them with anti-CD40 and IL-4 over a period of three or four days, you can in, uh, induce um, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the B cells to switch to either IgG1 or IgE. So it allows you to study that process uh, in culture. The class switch recombination I've illustrated here. Uh, for immunoglobulin heavy chain locus in the mouse. So uh, on chromosome 12, the Vs, Ds, and Js are in a three megabase region out here. They're assembled into a productive VDJ, B cells develop, and then in, active, in mature B cells, when they're activated for class switching, they can take that VDJ exon that's normally expressed with the CMU heavy chain exons, which lie just a few KB downstream and make IgM antibodies, and exchange them for another constant region further downstream, anywhere from 100 to 200 KB, that puts another constant region on that heavy chain and now allows them to express an IgG1 antibody. So the way class switch recombination works in general terms, as illustrated here, is that each of these sets of constant region exons lined up on the chromosome are flanked by a set of sequences referred to as a switch region. And switch regions, unlike the VDJ recognition sequences, are quite long. Um, and they're anywhere from uh, several KB up to about 10 to 12 KB for the switch gamma 1 region. So they're long sequences. They have unusual DNA structures. And each of these switch regions that under, uh, for, for the different sets of heavy chain constant regions lies into a transcription unit that are preceded by promoters that actually are the targets of the cytokines and activators that activate the promoter and turns on transcription of the target switch region. So if you activate B cells with anti-CD40 and IL-4, the switch mu region, which is a donor switch region, is ex already expressed. And then the, the switch gamma 1 or the switch epsilon regions now get turned on for transcription. And the transcription targets a AID, activation to do cytidine deaminase, to the switch regions where it um, deaminates cytidines. And without going into the details of that uh, process, and in, in, a, in a lot of work done significantly by Michael Neuberger, the deaminated cytidine mutations get turned into double-strand breaks. And double-strand breaks in uh, uh, the target switch mu region get joined to double-strand breaks in the target switch gamma 1 region. <clears throat> and they then those switch regions get joined. And now you express a heavy chain uh, with a different constant region gene. And, uh, we know that the double-strand breaks are joined by two pathways that, that we've shown a while back, both classical non-homologous end joining, but in its absence also an alternative end joining pathway that we're still trying to understand better. Um, okay, so again, the switch mu, preceding switch mu, the nearest sets of constant region genes lie anywhere from 100 to 200 KB downstream. Uh, notice the way I've diagrammed this is that when you join Switching uh, the downstream side of this break gets joined to the upstream side of the switch mu break so that everything's in the chromosome. What's in the middle gets excised as a circle. I'm going to come back to how that, if that's so, and how that works a little bit later. So the question we had a while back, which led us into um, a lot of what we've been doing recently, was just to ask the question, how do breaks made in switch mu and um, breaks made in switch gamma 1, 100 KB away, get joined. I mean, why don't they not just get rejoined? Why do they get joined to another sequence downstream 100 KB and not to a different chromosome or et cetera? So one of the questions or one of the ideas was that AID or switch regions themselves might somehow be involved in a process that causes them to synapse. And that might be some specialized function that would allow these breaks to find each other and, and be joined. So to test that, what Ali Zarin did a number of years ago was to cut out the 10 KB gamma 1 switch region, replace it with a yeast ISC1 endonuclease target site. Then we made uh, B cells in mice in which the gamma-1 switch region was replaced with an ISC1 site. If you activate those B cells with anti-CD40 and IL-4, they don't switch to gamma-1 because AID doesn't break the ISC1 site. But if you induce ISC1 in the cells in any of a number of ways, you can get fairly robust, I mean, in certain circumstances, up to 50% of normal 
class switch recombination showing that this ISC1 site can uh, break, can join to AID initiated switch mu breaks over this 100 kb distance. And in fact, if you replace both switch regions with ISC1 site and you uh, induce ISC1, you can still get fairly robust class switching. Um, and uh, that is in cells that don't have AID and cells that don't have switch regions. So it shows that just two breaks in the IGH locus can actually join uh, and give physiological or near physiological levels of class switch recombination. So the question is, how does that work? And that's something I, I want to come back to and answer uh, later after I introduce some of the technologies. But in doing this, we, 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 we think of class switching as a, a short intrachromosomal translocation where two breaks get joined to each other through some sort of an end joining pathway, uh, and which uh, also explains what happens in many chromosomal translocations. So the, when we found that we could find this happening, um, what we realized a number of years ago is if we put an ISC1 target site in here and use that as a bait, we should be able to find where it translocates across the genome. So we did that and uh, we set up a, a, a method that we called high throughput genomic translocation sequencing. Uh, uh, a number maybe three or four years ago, and then we used that to put fixed breaks in, uh, we started uh, in the IGH locus or in the CMYK gene, and then uh, I won't go through the details, but use sort of standard genomic uh, cloning uh, technologies now to clone from that induced ISC1 break and then ask where in the genome it would translocate to. And we did this first of all in B cells were activated with anti-CD40 and IL-4, so you were inducing class switching. So one of the things that we knew we should find would be that ISC1 site in the IGH locus going into, uh, into switch region breaks, because we already showed that worked in the previous pay, uh, study I mentioned. And then the question is where, the, where do CMYK breaks go, et cetera. So when we did that and, and cloned these sequences, uh, and we got hundreds of thousands of, of, of junctions that were isolated from primary B cells activated for class switching, and we found that indeed breaks in CMYK or breaks in uh, IGH locus could translocate throughout uh, the genome. Um, uh, to many, many different sequences, very, very broadly, but there were hot spots. And I should say, Raphael, sitting in the front row here, was collaborating with Michelle Nusenzweig and, and, and had very similar findings. Um, so, now when we want to look at these breaks and see where they go, we, de we decided to plot them in a way that we felt was the easiest way to see it because there are obviously some spots where the breaks are really, uh, you know, you have thousands of, of breaks going in other places with one. So instead of linear scales, we developed a dot plot uh, method to, it's sort of like a heat map, uh, way to plot them. And, and basically, uh, we divide the, the, the genome up into various size bins, and uh, it could be any size you want, but in this one, to show the whole genome and all the chromosomes, we, we divide it up into 1.5 megabase bins. And then what happens is, if we put a break in CMYK, let it translocate in the B cells that have been activated for class switching to um, gamma 1 and, and, and uh, epsilon. Uh, if you get one translocation in that 1.5 megabase bin, you have a black dot. If you get five, you have a red dot. 20, uh, you get a yellow dot, and, and so on. Uh, so it sort of compresses everything, and you can see what's going on. So in the activated B cells, the thing you notice, a uh, lot, of, lot of things happening right at the break site. Well, a lot of that, we, because we sequence the junctions in this method, we can tell orientation, and we know that the vast majority of this stuff are resections, which is something you would expect. It's, so it's not a translocation, it's a break that came apart, one end got resected away, and then it joined. And that's, I won't go into it, it's in the papers. But throughout the rest of the genome, uh, and, and even around the break site, there are lots of translocations, and, and they go everywhere, and there are hot spots, and et cetera. And I'll, tell, I'll just summarize it in a second, but one major hot spot you can see is over here on the end of chromosome 12, where you see thousands of translocations coming from CMYK. And of course, we know that's the location of the IGH locus. So basically, if you take this and now do the same kind of analysis, but you just take that 1.5 megabase bin and say, where are those? thousands of translocations. It turns out that uh, from CMYK, the majority of the translocations are in the switch mu region, switch gamma 1 region, and the switch epsilon region, which are the three regions that we know are breaking in this particular type of cell that's targeted for class switch recombination, and very little anywhere else. So very specifically, it shows the method works. And if we make AID deficient B cells, what we find is it's almost all of this goes away. It goes down tremendously, but the switch mu region uh, and to a certain extent, switch gamma 1 are still translocation 
hotspots, even in the absence of AID, and that's something that we, and I think Mike Potter here and others, uh, have said before that switch regions are structurally unstable and they're prone to break, um, and they will translocate in the absence of AID, but just at hundreds of, of fold, uh, hundredfold lower level. I'm gonna come back to this a little bit later. Uh, so this study, which was published a couple of years ago, and the people who did it are, are listed here, had a couple of major points. One is that if you make a break in IGH or in CMYK, those breaks can translocate to sites very widely spread across the genome. Um, the, we found that both uh, normal AID targets, switch regions in these cells, and also off-target AID-initiated double-strand breaks are the major translocation hotspots in B cells activated for class switching. So basically, uh, the real hotspots um, all go away or go, are great, re, greatly reduced in the absence of AID. So that's an inactivated B cell. So AID is really the key factor to make breaks that translocate. Um, other major translocation hotspots in these studies and others are actually cryptic sites for the ISC1 enzyme across the genome. And we found 20 some of those, I think, that we characterized in detail and showed they were all, all cut sites, which is very important for the um, meganuclease or the zinc finger or the tailin fields because the assay actually allows us to, we, we found now uh, using other types of enzymes in human cells, some of the enzymes cut hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in the genome or even more. Um, so it's a great assay when one's trying to use an enzyme like this for targeting or for uh, gene therapy, et cetera. It, this assay gives you more sites than you can imagine. It, and it allows one, I think it's really good because it allows one to really determine how good the enzyme is and figure out how to improve it. Um, now the other thing is once you get past the major hotspots and you have a lot of translocations across the genome, and those we found uh, sig some significant fraction of them locate themselves to transcription start sites. So transcription in one way or another um, seems to target translocations. And that was true for AID hotspots where we would have a, a way, uh, we can rationalize that because transcription is necessary to target AID by making the appropriate substrate. But it also, to others that aren't, weren't, weren't AID hotspots. So in part that could be because transcription is generating double strand breaks and in part it could be for um, spatial proximity reasons, uh, which I'll come back to. So that's what we found in activated B cells. And then we also um, have looked in uh, uh, pro-B cell lines that mimic pro-B cells, and then I'll show you some other data I don't think I showed last time, I'm not sure, in, in, in T cells that we differentiate in culture to ask where are their translocation hotspots. So the pro-B system that we use, developed by Yu Zhang in our lab, it was developed by Mark Schlissel and then Barry Sleckman uh, earlier, it exploits the Abelson murine leukemia virus transformed cell lines that uh, we've been using for decades. Uh, um, David Baltimore's lab first started using these lines to study B cell development. Uh, and the nice thing about Abelson lines is that if you infect bone marrow uh, cells from, with an Abelson virus, you get out pro-B or pre-B cell lines. Those lines are rapidly proliferating. They don't, like normal pro-B cells, they don't express much of the RAG proteins because the RAGs are, are restricted, as others have shown over the years, to G1. But what Mark Schlissel showed is if you uh, arrest these cells by treating with the ABL kinase inhibitor, Gleevec, then you arrest them in G1 and then RAG gets turned on. The problem is it also kills them. Um, so what Barry Sleckman showed is if you put an emu BCL2 transgene into this background, it will now keep them alive and these cells will be arrested in G1 and they'll sit there for, for days and days and days, I mean weeks. Um, without dying, RAG goes up and RAG will target endogenous uh, loci that are substrates, which previously was shown to be the Ig kappa locus, which would be a substrate in a pre line. Um, what Yu Zhang did was to modify this further. He put ISC1 substrates in many different locations, clonally, each one in, in, in lines, and then uh, used a GR ISC1 fusion protein that sits in the cytoplasm at the same time when you Gleevec treat, you treat them with TA so that that ISC1 goes into the nucleus and it cuts wherever its target is very, very well. So you do these experiments with wild-type Abelson virus transform lines, you find very few translocations. Um, and that's something we knew cytogenetically. These guys either repair their breaks well or have great checkpoints in these lines. So we went on to ATM-deficient lines, which we knew uh, showed much more instability in these lines, and used those for all the analysis in the Abelson virus transform lines. 
So this is the kind of data that you got, Yuzang got. Um, if you make the break, say, say you put the ISC1 site on chromosome 18, make the break there, uh, let it translocate, make the translocation libraries, where does it translocate to? And what he found was by far the major hotspots were the endogenous RAG targets, the known one, Ig kappa, but also IgH, T cell receptor gamma, T cell receptor alpha, and Ig lambda. Um, and uh, so in the, the known RAG targets. Then there's a background of other things that we're still collaborating with David Schatz, uh, I guess indirectly with Raphael maybe, to, to study um, additionally. But the RAGs were the, the major targets. And he put the thing in eight different locations, uh, different chromosomes. And wherever he put it, it's always the RAG, uh, I mean, it's always the RAG targets that immunoglobin T cell receptor lists are always the targets. So, and, and similar ratios. So the dominant hotspots in pro B cell lines are the known immunoglobulin locus target, but also T cell receptor targets. And no matter where you put the substrate, you find those. And I come back to that. Um, Li Zhan Zhao in the lab has looked now also in developing primary alpha, beta, gamma, delta T cells by taking bone marrow cells, putting them on a, a stromal cell culture that allows their, their differentiation. And in T cell development, uh, in generally the way, the way it works out, as it has been shown by many people, not us, is that early in development, the T cell receptor beta gene, gamma genes, and delta genes all rearrange. And there's a competition, at least the way some people view it. And if the VDJ beta occurs first, it'll drive cells to the alpha beta T cell pathway. They'll go on to rearrange TCR alpha genes. Delta locus lies right in the middle of TCR alpha, which is interesting, and then they can become alpha beta T cells, major T cell lineage. But if gamma or delta uh, uh, are rearranged first, then uh, that will drive them into the gamma delta pathway. So she, um, again, took the primary um, uh, bone marrow cells and then let them differentiate to the T cells on an OP9 stromal cell system, um, and, and, and again, used ATM deficient cells to get lots of translocations. In this case, she used the CMIC locus as the target and said, where did it, where did it translocate to? And we, we've got lots of translocations from our T cell libraries. And, but again, what we found was uh, the T cell receptor alpha delta locus was the dominant uh, target for translocations. But the other dominant targets are all listed in blue with the T cell receptor gamma locus, T cell receptor beta locus, and the immunoglobulin kappa locus. The heavy chain locus didn't really show up. Um, but once again, it shows that in di differentiating T cells, when you have a break, the major translocation targets are the RAG targets, uh, and not the ones necessarily all that you would expect, but they're all bona fide RAG targets. The hotspots listed in green were all bona fide hotspots, and those are all endogenous ISC1 sites that came up. So the libraries are working well. We do have some other hotspots in these cells um, that we're still trying to figure out. And one of the things we, we really want to figure out is, uh, is whether or not off-target sites are also RAG dependent, which is still something speculated. But when you look at where do the translocations go in developing ATM deficient T cells from CMIC, predominantly into alpha beta and predominantly into the, uh, because the delta locus is inside the alpha locus, delta locus rearranges earlier and almost everything are in the DJ delta segments. And this has come back because this is a, a region that we show as a major site of translocations that lead to CMIC amplification. I'm mean, sorry, that lead to, um, no, it's a different one. The translocations in, in ATM deficient T cell lymphomas. And in the beta locus, they're in the Ds and, J, uh, and, the Ds and Js, and in the uh, gamma loci, again, predominantly in those regions. So again, the, the, the assay is picking up uh, exactly the sequences. If you didn't know that these loci were rearranging, uh, you would know it from this, and you would know something about their order. So um, I'll, I'll come back again a little bit to this part of it. But the, the summary from that is if you look in developing ATM-deficient B and T cells, Major endogenous translocation hotspots are known RAG targets. So immunoglobulin loci are the major hotspot in developing B cells, and T cell receptor uh, delta locus is the biggest hotspot in developing T cells. Um, other major um, uh, hotspots in developing T cells, um, as I mentioned, so the delta and the uh, J, D and J region, if you go inside the locus, are the major hotspots within the locus, and those are the site of recurrent translocations and ATM deficient thymic lymphomas, as we showed a few years ago. Um, and that was a surprise because everybody thought it was going to the TCR alpha locus, but in fact, we found that these all go to the delta locus. Um, 
Uh, and there are substantial what you would call off-target RAG translocations. That means T cell receptor loci in developing pro B cells and kappa loci in developing pro T cells. Uh, most other sites are ISC1 sites, um, but there are others, and, and, and what we have to figure out is whether those in the general background, which as I said, we're, we're collaborating with David Schatz to find out whether those correlate with RAG binding sites, and that's something we'll see. So, um, so the, the, the Abelson virus transformed proB lines gave us an opportunity to look at the influence of spatial organization of the genome with respect to translocations. And this is all done in G1 arrested pro B cells. And what we did was to collaborate, once we found those results I told you about uh, a little earlier, about uh, putting sites in eight different locations, always finding the same antigen receptor loci. We engaged uh, Yob Decker and Rachel McCord to, do, uh, to collaborate and do high c on these cells, which is a genomic procedure just to look at how every sequence in the genome uh, the frequency with which it interacts with every other sequence in the genome. Uh, and when we did the high C, when they, Rachel and Yo did the high C in these G1 arrested cells, they found that the general organizational features, and again, this was published uh, about a year ago, uh, the general organizational features for these cycling cells were found in G1 arrested mouse cells. So that probably reflects the fact that cycling cells uh, spend a lot of time in G1. And basically that the mouse chromosomes are compartmentalized in these G1 arrested cells into open uh, transcribed components and closed uh, components. Chromatin at the megabase scale folds according to a fractal globule, as Yob had published uh, a number of years before for the human cells. Um, and I'll come back a little bit to the, that aspect. And that chromosomes themselves have preferred relative positions with longer chromosomes tending to much more frequently be uh, sequences on longer chromosomes are much more frequently uh, proximal to sequences on longer chromosomes than, uh, than they are to sequences on shorter chromosomes and vice versa. And that's something that's seen cytogenetically uh, years ago. So and the significance isn't known, but it, it's clearly a fact. And also on a chromosome, sequences on a chromosome uh, are much more uh, uh, frequently proximal to sequences on a chromosome than to any other sequences. Um, and that, we'll come back to that. But I think the key finding for us in terms of interpreting some of our results was the finding of cellular heterogeneity and spatial genome organization, meaning that while there's pre uh, preferred average orientations of the genome, that if you take a very large population of cells, that sequences that you wouldn't consider to be proximal, say cytogenetically, uh, on a population level, at least in some cells, are proximal. Uh, so, uh, and and that, that becomes a very important um, aspect, of at least how we interpret our findings. And that is the idea that cellular heterogeneity in the spatial genome organization drives translocation hotspots in these G1 arrested mouse proB cells. And so basically what we found, um, uh, again, what, what, what Yob finds in all of his high c studies and, every, and everybody else who does the technique is that the observed interaction frequency of two genomic regions corresponds to the fraction of cells in which those two sequences are physically together so that you can cross-link them. Um, and so high c studies of G, these G1 arrested proby lines and other cell types reveals cellular heterogeneity and spatial genome organization. So there, you know, again, some sequences are highly uh, proximal to others uh, in most cells, but uh, lots of sequences uh, in only a very small fraction of cells still are physically proximal. And when we looked at antigen receptor loci, IGH, kappa, lambda, TCR alpha, delta, gamma, et cetera, the ones that were hot spots in these proby lines with eight different locations in large chromosomes, small chromosomes, et cetera, we found that these 40 pairs of loci were in close spatial proximity in a subpopulation of cells. So uh, they weren't all really what you would consider spatially proximal uh, if you looked at the average, but at least in some fraction of the cells they were. And the idea here is that if you have really frequent double strand breaks, that can drive recurrent translocations that we see of sequences that one wouldn't consider classically proximal, say cytogenetically, and that's because of the cellular heterogeneity in, in uh, spatial genome organization. And we um, tried to put this together in a, a simple way recently in, in, a, uh, in a review, um, and so again, uh, very simplified because one thing that we're, we're you know, and we, some of this work has been done down here that allows us to at least say um, 
think about this, that the, the absence of substantial double strand break movement, and, and the current thinking in the field is the mammalian cells that breaks don't move, and the Easter's data that they do, or they don't move much, but you know, there's still, I think that's a, a, an emerging field. But what we, um, the idea is in that case, what you would say is the frequency that which a translocation form would be a, a, a uh, related to uh, some uh, function of double, the frequency of double strand breaks at, at, at site A, double strand breaks at site B, and then the synapsis frequency. So the key point of that is most, at least from genome studies, a very large fraction of translocations appear to be joining two double strand breaks. So if you have one double strand break occurring at high frequency and another double strand break at low frequency, that um, you know, that the frequency of synapsis becomes very important, but what, what happens is because this is, in a sense, a square of double strand break frequencies, the really frequent double strand breaks can drive a reaction where synapsis frequency is low. And that's sort of indicated here, where here you have a lot of breaks uh, on the chromosomes, but synapsis frequency is lower. So actually, you only have a, 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 a limited number of, of cells. I mean, with a real high frequency of double strand breaks, synapsis frequency lower, you can drive translocations because there's a greater chance when two breaks are proximal, they're going to be broken together. Whereas if synapsis frequency is much greater, but double strand breaks is very low, even though sequences are close together, quite often, if they're not broken, they don't translocate. I mean, that's, that's the sort of simple minded view of it, but then there's, of course, everything in between. So this was the, uh, what was the, put here is, is, is uh, looking uh, at spatial genome organization. So, so that could explain why frequent breaks drive translocations. But now we wanted to, to, to also ask more generally, what's the role of spatial proximity? And the problem with trying to look at that in these cell lines, these Abelson virus transformed cell lines, or in the activated B cells that I mentioned before, is you have these breaks that are occurring really, really frequently at a few sites, and they're driving most of the translocations. Um, so these actively transcribed AID or RAG hotspots drive translocations both by increasing the break frequency and potentially also by increasing the frequency of actively transcribing genes and therefore their association, say, in transcription factories. Um, so in B cells, there also is the cycling changes and all the changes in genome organization that could uh, confound the, re the results. And then you want to look at many different break sites if you want to come to general conclusions. So what uh, Yu Zhang did was to take these Abelson virus transform proby lines that have each line has a single integration site, but uh, we had eight different ones that we looked at. Then what he did to try to normalize break frequency and reduce the dominant breaks at the antigen receptor loci, RAG breaks, he irradiated the lines uh, to generate random breaks across the genome uh, and did it for all these different lines. And again, you make these ectopic irradiation-initiated breaks and try, did some things to titrate it and show that, in fact, it reduced the dominance of the RAG breaks. So there, then, you can look more at features of spatial genome organization. So when you do that experiment, here's what you find, wherever you put it. So again, we're just looking at this chromosome 18. So you remember, without irradiation, immunoglobulin loci and T-cell receptor loci are the dominant features of the translocation lens. That when you irradiate it, you get a lot more translocations everywhere. We didn't get completely rid of the dominance, so you still see them there, but it went down like about tenfold in terms of dominance. But what you find, wherever you put it, is the chromosome that has the break, essentially the whole chromosome now becomes a big hot spot. And you can put the break on a large chromosome, now that becomes a hot spot. And what he also did was he, he did this in, in uh, F1 uh, mice that were A, B allotypes, so that he had markers that could uh, distinguish the two alleles. And this is a completely cis phenomenon, so it's only the cis chromosome. And when we compared that with the high C that Job did, as we expected based on his earlier work, in fact, this can all be explained by the fact that the, on a chromosome, the, the sequences are much more proximal. A much higher frequency of being proximal to each other within a single chromosome in cis uh, than they do to other chromosomes, including the trans partner chromosome. Um, so that explains why this is the most dominant feature of, of spatial proximity that one sees uh, when you do this type of an experiment. So again, what the uh, overall um, conclusions from this was that, uh, and, and again, Raphael and his had paper came to 
stated differently, but I think quite similar conclusion. Double strand breaks are key rate limiting factors for translocations, but once they're generated, spatial proximity uh, can guide the double strand break joining to form translocations. So the position of a double strand break in the genome really influences the landscape of translocation partners genome wide. Um, so, in the, but if, if you don't have double strand breaks, uh, synapsis frequency really drives frequencies of translocations that allow you to see other uh, factors that will cause certain classes of genes to have an increased chance of being proximal and thereby translocating. So the kind of things that, that, that we found was uh, active versus inactive chromatin compartments when the, uh, the break is in active compartments, which all the ones we've looked at were, uh, it's mostly translocating to other genes across the genome in active compartments, not in inactive compartments. Active transcription um, uh, is something that can enhance translocations. Existence on similar size chromosomes, so if it's a big chromosome, you tend to translocate more to big chromosomes in our assay. Uh, small chromosome, more to small chromosomes, and that, again, fits perfectly with proximity. And the, again, the most notable thing is being on the same chromosome. Um, and so there's many potential implications. One is that uh, breaks, uh, many breaks giving rise to translocations occur at low frequencies, so in that case, proximity is going to have a much more major role in guiding translocations. Uh, and formation of translocations between randomly generated breaks, for example, those that might be induced in chemotherapies and radiotherapies might reflect a stronger influence of spatial proximity. And then it might also, some of these things we see on the chromosome be quite relevant to uh, interpreting aspects of um, cancer genomes and complex karyotypes. So chromothripsis, where you have this chromosome, cis chromosome catastrophe phenomenon, might in some ways be related to um, the, the, the fact that uh, breaks tend to join to breaks on the same chromosome. It, it can't explain it from all aspects of it, but it might be quite relevant to that. Okay, now the going from the proximity um, argument, I want to take it back to class switching and then address a couple of, of questions. And, and one of the things is we know that when you have two breaks, 100 to 200 kb apart, AID initiates lots of breaks in these switch regions, so some of them get joined back together in a switch region. That makes something called an internal switch region deletion, which I, uh, hopefully I'll get time to come back to in a second. Uh, and, and so that, a lot of the breaks either get rejoined or rejoined within the same switch region. That happens. Occasionally they get translocated, but at some significant frequency, we showed with the ISC1, maybe about 10 percent of the frequency at which you see things joining two breaks within the switch region, they join to a break downstream uh, in the target switch region. So the question is, why is that happening? What, um, how does that happen? So it was, you know, one thing that was considered was that the IGH locus itself might be arranged in some 3D organization that would promote that. And that, I don't think that's completely ruled out, but, um, or could there be more general properties? So one thing we did when we had two ISC1 breaks and we could see switching, we did other assays like our high throughput assays and we looked in other cell types like ES cells, T cells, and what we found is those two breaks also joined at really high frequency in the IGH locus in other cell types. So it wasn't a property of B cells, but it could be still IGH locus. So what Monica Gostas had did was put a break uh, in the CMIC gene on chromosome 15, and then she put another break downstream in the PVT1 locus, which is a common site for translocations. So now she can introduce breaks in the CMIC gene, like we did in the IGH locus, separated by 100 KB, like in the IGH locus, did the whole genome-wide translocation cloning, but only here focusing on the CMIC locus to see how frequently those, uh, th this break in CMIC joins to this break in PVT. And what she found was that, um, um, that, that probably about 85 percent of all joins in these cells are either uh, right at the locus, many of which are resections, or to this region, or to the break that's 100 kb downstream, and about 20 percent of all of these breaks that are made up here that we can recover join to the break in the PVT locus downstream. So. Um, around 10 percent of the total of breaks that are made here, if we do the calculation at least, get joined downstream 100 kb. So that's a very high frequency. And we know from the frequency in the IGH locus, if we inserted a C gamma 1 gene here and a C mu gene here, or, you know, a, a two constant region genes right there in the CMIC locus, with ISC1, the frequency at which they got joined would be enough to give you substantial class switching in a totally different part of the genome. 
So we looked at this a different way. We went back and analyzed our old Abelson virus um, uh, data where we put um, breaks in different chromosomes. So here we had a break on chromosome 18. And as I told you before, if you make that break, these are, again, ATM deficient cells, G1 arrested. And w where it goes most frequently is to sites along the same chromosome in both directions. And it will also go occasionally to other chromosomes, but much less frequently. And then what we asked is, um, what is, along the chromosome, what is the frequency at which translocations occur? So here, what we did is we don't want resections or anything like that, so all that we looked at are translocations joining two double-strand breaks that would result in an inversion. That, that way we know that has to be joining two separate breaks. And when we did that and looked along the chromosome, what we found in these cells, and it may not be the same in every cell, but in these cells, that breaks within somewhere between one megabase or less on either side, somewhere maybe this side, maybe a couple hundred KB, are much more frequently joined than breaks just a little further out or down the chromosome. So it suggests, you know, and, and then we did the same thing on chromosome 18, which now, again, the breaks here will join up and down that chromosome, not so much the chromosome two, but on 18, now we find the same thing. Looking again for inversion, so again, we know it's uh, two breaks getting joined. Uh, and once again, the frequency goes way up within you know, several hundred KB of where the break is. And that fits with the ISC1 joining. And it's just another example in a different cell type, uh, randomly integrated break, that, that we see the same phenomenon. Um, and again, might not be in every cell type, might not be, uh, and that's something we have to look at more. But in, we think, um, and I haven't proven this, but we think that this property, because we see it in different loci, different cell types with the same loci, is likely promoted by spatial genome, genome organization of chromatin, potentially into megabase or less sized topological domains, in which have been a number of papers from several different labs uh, published about that. At least that's, we would speculate that's the case. Um, we don't have any evidence um, specifically, other than uh, the, some of the, the high C also shows this uh, proximity effects where we've looked. Um, now, why would this be important? So in general in cells, this would not be an issue for a cell because the chance of two random breaks occurring within 100 KB of each other in a genome would be quite rare. Um, where it would most greatly impact joining, though, is if somehow you recurrently had breaks that were in a, a smaller distance of each other in the genome. So we think, we proposed this before, class switching may have evolved from somatic hypermutation uh, by uh, a, a general predisposition of double strand breaks, we would say in close, we call this close proximity, and probably in other contexts, we and others before called it long distance, but close proximity, 100 to 2KB apart, to be joined at high frequency by these general mechanisms. It might be relevant to some aspects of VDJ recombination. We think it could also be relevant um, to certain cancers where um, one sees frequent, recurrent, fairly short intrachromosomal deletions that's common in TLLs, and you know, Steve Ellage and others have, have shown this uh, in a variety of cancers. So if they were regions that were structurally prone to, to breaks uh, that were fairly close by, we think that this mechanism would tend to join them together a lot and may have relevance, and that's something we want to look into more. Okay. So now, the last part of this, I want to talk about the ATM-dependent DNA damage response and its role in class switching. Um, and particularly what we and many others have known for a while is that one of the substrates of ATM, 53BP1, has a specialized role. So class switch recombination double strand breaks, as was shown by Andre Nussenzweig here, uh, activate the ATM-dependent DNA damage response, uh, and which ATM phosphorylates, I mean, all, uh, that was shown for many breaks, but he showed it specifically for class switch breaks, uh, where it phosphorylates a number of substrates, including 53BP1, H2AX, you know, and Bill Bonner's work here, and all, et cetera, but, uh, and that those can mediate cell cycle checkpoints and, and DNA repair. So if you make ATM or H2X deficient B cells, uh, switching goes down to about 50% or so, but it doesn't go out. So they have an important role, but it's not absolute. And that leads to increased IGH locus breaks and translocations, shown both by our lab and by uh, Andre and Michelle. Um, so, but again, we, uh, and our collaborators, and, and Michelle and Andre and their collaborators, showed that 53BP1 
is required for class switching. If you get rid of 53BP1, you get very little class switching. It's only a few percent. So it goes much more down than these other factors. And, um, but the IGH locus breaks, as, as we've shown, uh, I think they did too, uh, still occur at similar levels as to what you see in H2X and ATM deficiencies. So it's, it's said that 53BP1 must play some more specialized role in class switching than the other factors, but then the question is what are they? Um, and the things that people talk about, uh, long synapses, uh, that somehow it was involved in bringing breaks 100, you know, 100 KB apart together. Also, end joining pathway choice, and that's something, uh, both of those were suggested from work from um, Michelle and Andre, um, I think mostly Michelle. Uh, and the reason for that, and, 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 and this is a fact, is that in 53 BP1 deficient cells, although you don't see much class switching, you see these big internal switch region deletions. So the idea is AID is targeting switch regions, but somehow they're not being brought together to join, so they just join internally, either because they're not brought together or because of uh, microhomologies and things that, 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 that affect the, um, the pathway. But th none of this can explain this, in our mind, the huge decrease. So the way we have looked at this, um, if you take B cells, 53 BP1 deficient, um, and you look at wild type, you look at 53 BP1 deficient, as I said, they don't switch much compared to wild type. When they're activated, say, to switch to gamma 1. But now if you put an ISCE1 site in place of switch gamma 1, and you activate those B cells for switching, under the ways we did this, I mean, switching is not really high, but still 6%, uh, roughly 6% of the, 5 or 6% of the B cells will switch when you uh, induce ISC1 and AID in the same cell and the IC1 breaks join to switch mu. So again, substantial switching, you know, it's 5% of the cells. Um, but if you make them 53 BP1 deficient, that only reduces to like 2% uh, percent or so. It doesn't go down to background. Uh, so here it goes way down, but with an ISC1 break, it doesn't, it only goes down by half. So that uh, the, the whole, you know, distance thing, all that, it, it becomes confusing then, because uh, these are equally distant, but this only goes down by half. So what Fei Long Min, know, in our lab, uh, knowing about this result, and we were thinking about it, he looked at 53 BP1 deficient B cells, and he did um, uh, chip analysis, and he looked at recruitment of AID to switch regions. And uh, what he found, uh, and this is the first time I presented this data, uh, what he found was um, that in 53 BP1 deficient B cells, unlike, say, H2AX deficient B cells or ATM deficient B cells, but more like AID deficient B cells, not quite as bad, there's very little AID getting recruited to the switch regions. And so that was really a surprise. And we had earlier work that um, the antibodies don't work as well that we had shown like about three or four or five years ago that. 53 BP1 gets recruited to switch regions and, and uh, AID deficient cells. And I've been trying to talk to Raphael about helping us uh, get that back up and running again because uh, it's an important point. But, but here is the point that relates to what I said before uh, in terms of double strand breaks and switching. So AID recruitment maybe, or, or AID goes down, um, say, say it goes down by three, I think it was about three fold, three to four fold in the 53 BP1 deficiency. But remember, that's two switch regions, gamma one and switch mu. So you gotta make breaks at both. So if you recruit three to four fold less AID at switch mu and three to four fold less AID at switch gamma one, that means it's, you gotta multiply those and the real defect is gonna be around 10 to 15 fold in class switching. And I think this is probably the missing point that's been puzzling us uh, about how, uh, why 53BP1 has such a big effect on switching. So then what we did was uh, Monica Gostas and Jisei Hu made, uh, took CMIC and took wild type and 53 BP1 deficient B cells and activated them for switching and then made translocation libraries. Um, and what they found was, uh, it's interesting, they, they found that um, uh, actually in 53 BP1 deficient cells, translocations went way down. Uh, and that corresponds to cytogenetics. So there are many fewer translocations in 53 BP1 deficient cells. But the IGH locus may, is the same kind of a hot spot that it is in wild type cells. It's a little bit different than um, what some others found, but you know, this is what it is. So s translocations are down, but breaks in IGH locus for translocations, as we know cytogenetically, remain the same in the IGH locus, but not elsewhere in the genome. Um, so then, when you take those breaks and you say in the IGH locus, what happens 
to them, and you look in ATM deficient, wild type, and 53 BP1 deficient cells, they go into the IGH locus. So this is the mu switch region. So in a, in a wild type cell, almost all the breaks get joined in the mu switch region and in a particular spot of it. In ATM deficient cells, still mostly in the mu switch region and uh, still mostly in the same part. 53 BP1 deficient cells, you can see the breaks get joined. And I won't go into the details how you figure this, but this is resection, this is a resection quadrant. They start spreading out over many KB. So large switch region resections go out over two to three uh, KB or more. So you get really huge resection. Fits with Michelle's, Nusenzweig's uh, data in the past that indicated a role for 53 BP1 in protecting against resection, although this shows the, uh, the size and, uh, of, of, of these. So how does this work into a model for, for how, AID, or how 53 BP1 is working on class switching? So the idea is that in wild type cells, 53 BP1 helps recruit AID to switch regions. They get deaminated, you get breaks, and you get a certain frequency of breaks in switch mu and in switch gamma one, and that will drive joining because of the, you know, again, they're only 100 KB apart, so frequent breaks, really proximal based on that, drives joining and you get class switching. But in a 53 BP1 deficient cell, you have less 53 BP, less AID recruited, that's what we found, less breaks, and now you have less breaks in switch mu, less breaks in switch gamma one, so it goes down uh, you have to multiply those two to see how far it goes down. So switching goes down uh, 10 to 15 fold because of less switch region, uh, less AID recruitment. Um, but then you're left with this really interesting issue is what, how do you explain the increased internal switch region deletions uh, that, that, that Michelle Nussenzweig found before and would suggest uh, lots of AID targeting? Oh, my, my slides, okay. Uh, and, and the answer to that is that the, um, in the absence of 53 BP1, you have big resections. And the way you look for internal switch region deletion is on a southern blot where you can see a band that changes in size. So if you have many fewer breaks, but those breaks get resected at KB, and in wild type cells they don't. They have to get joined to each other to give you a shift on a southern blot. But in 53 BP1, lower levels of breaks get resected, and they now show up as big deletions on southern blots, and, and so it's really the deletions in 53 BP1 versus the internal switch region deletions in wild type could be contributed by two totally different processes. And we have evidence for that uh, that I'm not showing you. And the last part that I'll, I'll quickly show you is the other thing of 53 BP1. What maintains a productive orientation of class switching? So as I should, normally in a textbook, you, know, you make a break in switch gamma one, a break in switch mu, the switch gamma one break, downstream side of the break is joined to the upstream side of the switch mu break, and that gives you productive class switching. And the internal, the inside breaks are, are joined, and that gives you the circle. But the question is, uh, in RAG, because of the way RAG hands off the signal encoding ends, there's always an orientation. But what happens, uh, why is it that the downstream side of a break doesn't get joined to uh, the downstream side and make um, inversions? In, in class switching, and you know, uh, and, and so, and in fact, nobody ever looked at that. But we've used uh, a, a circularization PCR, we meaning uh, John <coughs> John Manis and Sabrina Volpe, and we've looked in in, in uh, B cells, and we find, in fact, that this is the major pathway of switching. So why don't they do this? So what we did was to take advantage of this switching that we see with uh, when we put an ISC1 break instead of a, uh, of a switch region. So we now put an ISC1 break here and we get AID initiated breaks in switch mu, do genome-wide translocation cloning, and then we ask, where does the downstream side of this break join in this assay? So you, um, you, you can categorize these based on how it joins and orients the sequences uh, upstream relative to the centromere is either minus, and that would be inversions, or is plus, that would be deletion and excision circles, depending if it went to switch mu or switch epsilon, which are the two breaks that get, get activated. So you can say, which of these are predominant? Does this look like the normal switch regions? And the answer is when you recover these breaks, this N goes to switch mu about 10 times more frequently uh, in the normal deletion orientation than it would in the inversion orientation. So there's something about that switch mu to ISC1 joining that mimics normal class switching, and that is that it has a direction. And when it goes down to epsilon, it makes the circle. And so that, again, mimics normal switching. 
And if you do it in an ATM deficient background, it's still biased that way. And if you do it in an H2X deficient background, it's still biased. But in the 53BP1 deficient background, 50-50 inversions and deletions. And, we, and when we, got, we did this with DCPCR for normal switching with S regions, and we get the same result um, with the residual joining. And if you take the upstream side of the break and you say which the whole genome-wide translocation cloning, but you're only looking within the IGH locus. So now minus is the normal deletion and cisn circle from, from mu, and plus is the inversions. And you say, which way do they go? And now what you see is minus is the dominant thing for switch mu and epsilon, meaning they're all, again, the upstream side's going just in the right orientation uh, for normal deletional switching. And for the, uh, uh, the, gam for the ATM, um, it's still biased the same way. For uh, H2AX, it's still biased. Uh, in, in other words, bias means that it goes in the way that gives productive switching. And for 53BP1, it's pretty much normalized. Um, and then you can ask, uh, is, is this something specific about being in the IGH locus? So we can take a CMIC double-strand break on a different chromosome, let it translocate into IGH, recover those in wild type and 53BP1 deficient background. And surprisingly, CMIC, when it finds the ends, it finds them, it's, it's completely unbiased. So, uh, the joining of CMIC breaks, in other words, from a different chromosome into switch mu, is not orientation dependent. So to find orientation, you've got to be in the same chromosome. Um, and then is it dependent on the type of break? So you can now take two IFC1 sites in the same cell, do the same assay, where does this break go? So when the break goes to switch mu, the IFC1 break going to, uh, to another IFC1 break up there is completely unbiased. It will go to both directions. So the switch region itself is required for orientation because in the same cell, when it goes down to the epsilon switch region, which we didn't change, that shows still the normal biased joining in the productive direction. So joining of ISC1 breaks in place of gamma 1 in place of switch mu is orientation dependent, uh, but uh, uh, um, independent, I'm sorry, so the ISC1 to ISC1 orientation independent, but in the same cell down to epsilon remains orientation dependent. So it's really something about the switch region. Uh, and if you now, you can say, is it a cis or trans phenomenon? So we can take the break uh, in the ISC1 switch region. We've deleted mu in this line, so we can now recover uh, what would be translocations to the switch mu breaks in the cis, in the trans chromosome. And we can say when it goes into the trans chromosome, is it orientation dependent? And the answer is, it's essentially not orientation dependent when it goes to the break in trans. So it has to be in cis on the same chromosome and it requires the mu switch region. Um, we have some new data to say that uh, all switch regions might not work this way, which is fine because the mu switch region is the donor and it's the one that would uh, have to, to, to prescribe this orientation. Um, and um, again, um, you say, then we were worried that it might be, just be a trans effect and all you get in 53 BP1 deficient cells, which we know wasn't the case, but just to be compulsive, we did that experiment where you now looked at, at uh, the joining where you've deleted the switch mu and trans and you looked at the cis switch mu and cis and that's orientation dependent. So um, even in a, 50, in a 53 BP1 deficient background, it's not. So basically what we found is that joining during class switch recombination occurs mainly in the direct productive orientation, which is a perplexing thing that I don't know why people didn't think about it before, but how does that work when AID is making breaks and then sort of getting out of there and they seem to be joined by the normal uh, joining mechanism? And so orientation specific joining appears to require at least one S region and only occurs in cis joins. And probably it's going to be that switch mu and maybe switch epsilon or specialized for this. And that probably has significance for certain, a number of aspects of normal switching. Um, joining of cis ISC1 double strand breaks and normal class switch recombination breaks in the absence of 53BP1 is unbiased. So it, it doesn't, it, you know, it goes into the inversion orientation. And that function might be independent of its role as a substrate of ATM, although, as Michelle Nussenzweig pointed out to me, there could be convoluted ways that. Uh, they could, uh, uh, other things could f cover for each other. But clearly, other ATM-dependent damage response factors, when they're missing, don't, prefer, don't uh, confer this orientation independence. And what could it be due to? And again, uh, one thing, potentially, is the fact that when, in a, uh, uh, when breaks join into switch mu, uh, either in inverted or in um, productive orientation, uh, it, they will mostly, in a wild-type cell, go into the switch region. 
uh, in ATM deficient cells, again, they'll go into the switch region, but in 53 BP1 deficient cells, you get this big resection in both directions. So if there's some bias, maybe but the resection is, is, is uh, eliminating that by uh, chewing away a significant part of the switch region in these cells. And that's something we have to also uh, see. So orientation dependent double strand break joining promoted by S region structure and orientation. So mammalian switch regions are G rich on the non-template strand, so they already, uh, two, two sides of the joins are distinguished from each other because of that. And we, we in Michael Lieber's lab showed years ago that when you transcribe switch regions because of this property, they make stable R loops, which also distinguishes the two ends of the breaks because one of them will have an RNA bound to it in one direction and the other strand it'll be in, uh, in the other direction. So those are things that were easily tested and we'll have that tested uh, very soon. Um, and 53BP1 could neutralize that orientation dependence by promoting increased resection or maybe in another way. We'll have to figure that out. But it does give uh, another novel role for 53BP1 in class switching, which is suppressing orientation dependent joining. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. And that is that the specialized roles of 53BP1 versus other ATM dependent double strand break response factors in class switching. Um, what are they? So this is our model. Um, so we find reduced AID targeting, which is three to four fold um, uh, by, by chip, um, and both for switch mu and gamma one. So because you have, need breaks in both, that could in, reduce class switching by nine to 16 fold, because you have to have both targeted. So that can, I, th I think, might be the real answer that it's been missing for us about why, why 53BP1 is so important. Um, That'll get it down to 10% or less, but it's probably down even more. Uh, and the fact is, when you have one ISC, one break versus a switch region break, uh, we only get a 50 or 60% reduction. It's totally, 60% reduction roughly. It's totally consistent with, with these results. Um, we would argue that the increased, now, now you have to explain increased S region resection, uh, uh, and I mean S, increased X, S region internal deletions in, in a 53.1 deficient background. And we think resection can explain that with, re, don't have as many breaks, but when they get resection, the assay southern blotting, you find them uh, more frequently. Uh, and, the, and, and we have again evidence uh, to support that notion, but I haven't shown it all. In the absence of 53 BP1, though, we also know that S region breaks are repaired less efficiently than other breaks throughout the genome, and they persist. And we've shown that, so has Michelle. And that may be due to increased resection making ends that aren't functional for classical non homologous end joining, and the ones that get joined have to be joined by alternative end joining, but then that leaves breaks, further re reduces class switching at least a bit. Uh, and, and, and as you see, it reduces translocation versus uh, any breaks in. Uh, and the rest of the genome, for the most part. Uh, and then this uh, um, orientation bias gives another 50% decrease. So the overall effect, class switch recombination is down to about 2% or less, uh, and it's prominently due to decreased AID, but it's further enhanced by decreased end joining uh, of um, S region breaks and by the loss of orientation bias. And in that effect, it leaves class switch recombination only a few percent of wild type. And again, there's a lot of specialized functions for 53BP1 there that uh, we have to figure out exactly what they are. But um, um, I think we may, I mean, this has been a puzzle for us for, for a long time. And I think we can explain most aspects now of this really puzzling phenotype um, with this data. And I think uh, I'll quit there. I should mention that the, the orientation uh, dependent stuff was done again by uh, um, Jun Chao Dong, Monica Gostasa, uh, and Ji Se Hu. And, um, and, and, and thank you very much. We're a little over time, but maybe we could take one or two questions for people who are able to stay. Microphones are in the aisle, so please use those. Yes, please. Uh, is there any evidence that 53BP1 might be a sequence-specific DNA, DNA bending protein? Um, to my knowledge, I, there's no evidence that 53BP1 is a sequence-specific DNA bending protein. Um, Raphael, do you, I mean, he also, do you have any, ever seen any? No. So I don't think so, no. Okay. Uh, so Fred, what, uh, you mentioned that uh, translocations or rearrangements happen in cysts, but is it, have you, has, have, have you examined whether or not there's increased uh, rearrangements between homologous chromosomes, i.e. between maternal and maternal for the same chromosome? 
compare, uh, I'm sorry, or are the experiment's not able to do that? Increase between two, like, sister chromosomes? Well, not sister chromatids, but no, a maternal chromosome. I mean, those so two homologous chromosomes. Um, so for our assays, the, the uh, translocations, to the extent that we have the markers to map them, um, between two homologous chromosomes, the two copies, say, of chromosome 18, um, are no more frequent than they are to another, say, 18 on another small chromosome. So that seems to be distinct. That's something people wanted to do by HIC, but they never had the, the, the enough ability to cover the sequences and, 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 the, uh, and, and using the, the different inbred strains. But I think when you do the HIC, that's going to come up to a position effect. Well, there is a reception in the library right around the corner. You all are invited to continue the conversation with Dr. Alt uh, across there along with some coffee and cookies. But let's uh, thank our speaker again. Thank you.